Welcome back to the Revolution and Ideology podcast series called Myth is America. I'm Jared. I'm Nick. And uh, we're still rolling through the United States War for Independence in all of its various manifestations, uh, as we've already mentioned, saving some of the military history for military historians who care about that kind of stuff. Um, but uh, that doesn't mean there aren't topics that take place uh, when actual open combat, um, when they actually engage in open combat, that we probably still want to touch upon. And that's kind of where we're at here in this episode. You, uh, you, If you've been following along with us, you just uh, heard our episode or recently have heard our episode from Thomas Paine, uh, about Thomas Paine and his influence, his life, and of course his important work for this time period, Common Sense. And uh, we're kind of picking up, as far as the timeline is concerned, after Common Sense essentially blows up in the colonies. Again, it was the fastest-selling uh, publication in uh, in U.S. history um, per uh, per the ratio of humans uh, that existed at the time uh, in terms of uh, who was buying it. Um, in fact, actually, I'm picking up even slightly before its main publication. What I want to talk about is the formation of, of the military, of the Continental Army, one of the more famous armies in U.S. history, this original army and how they were treated and, and in some cases how poorly that treatment was and how maybe some of the promises that they were uh, given uh, to join – uh, the patriotic cause were never fully fulfilled. So that's what we're going to be talking about today alongside some other uh, interesting little tidbits about what the actual war was like. So I want to start with the Second Continental Congress that starts and that opens up in Philadelphia on May 10th of 1775. Now, unlike the First Continental Congress uh, that we talked about, uh, I want to say two episodes ago, this one um, accomplishes a little bit more than the First uh, Continental Congress. Here, they really ultimately come to the conclusion that they have two major tasks. The first task is they need to raise an army. And the second task is actually, you would think, kind of counterintuitive to the first one. They also are going to explore reconciliation after uh, the Lexington and Concord skirmishes. Uh, Nick, why do you think they're exploring both of these options? I mean, probably just to keep all their options open at this point. Is, I mean, it's kind of shrewd. I mean, we've been picking on these guys, the architects of this country, for some of their uh, morally or ethically questionable behavior. Um, but in this case, we, we can't deny that this is actually a shrewd tactic. They're planning for both possible scenarios, full-blown war or perhaps, again, finding themselves uh, being able to mend their relationship with the crown and or parliament. I think there's also probably some hesitation to go into full-blown warfare with the British Empire, that's got to be pretty horrifying, regardless of how much you're all for independence. Right. And also, they they let me be blunt. Like, these guys are not going to win a war with England alone. They, they have zero chance. They're also waiting on, perhaps, the arrival of an ally, which we will be talking about later in this episode, an ally that can uh, go toe-to-toe -to -toe with the British. Uh, because, again, the, the Americans have zero shot. Uh, contrary to popular belief, they would have got their asses handed to them in this war without help from another European power. So uh, we'll, they're also kind of holding out for that, that, uh, that aid. The nice thing about the Second Continental Congress, though, is that it does show these individuals assuming both political and military authority and the desire for self-determination. This Congress, this Congress, at least among the delegates that are there, is met with varying attitudes and suggestions, but there is no absolute consensus. There are people that we would eventually call – we didn't call them this back then, but I'll just use the term now since everyone knows it – like very hawkish. They were really into wanting to go to, to war, and yet there were others that did understand, as Thomas Paine even outlined some of them in Common Sense – that their life was pretty good. They had, the, uh, we've said it probably about 10 times now on this podcast, they had the highest standard of living in the entire British Empire. Do you want to put that in jeopardy by going to war? You could lose it all. Um, in fact, a good majority, at least initially, favored reconciliation for uh, protection purposes. There was a vocal and vigilant minority uh, for war, and as uh, one might imagine, that minority came primarily from Massachusetts. Why Massachusetts, Nick? Uh, they had the most to economically gain. Well, and those intolerable acts that we talked about about two episodes ago were all targeted directly at Massachusetts. It was the hotbed of revolutionary activity, pamphleteering. Uh, we know the Boston massacre took place there, even though it wasn't really much of a massacre. We also know that the Tea Party took place there, tarring and feathering. I mean, it was the hotbed of activity. Um, and the fact that the harbor had been shut down and that the government had more or less been canceled by parliament, they had the most, uh, they had the most to gain from war. 
So Nick's absolutely right there. By June 14th of 1775, they do officially vote to create the Continental Army, and they choose a man who had yet to uh, have any military success his entire life to become the commander-in-chief of that army, uh, none other than George Washington, of course, his biggest claim to fame to this point in his career was starting the French and Indian War that ended up being a nightmare for all parties involved. So uh, that's who they selected. Now, I am willing to bet that they made this selection, or I'm assuming they made this selection, because there were not nearly as many of the more decorated British officers uh, that had served in the British military that were willing to obviously take up a cause against their own crown. So, I mean, I, I, their options were limited, so we can forgive them a little bit for this. And like every, everyone else involved that we would call a founding father, the Benjamin Franklins and et cetera, they weren't going to go to war. So, And that's the biggest point, too. We're going to actually emphasize that throughout today. Like, we have to keep in mind these guys that we call the architects of the country outside of a handful – so not all of them. There were. Washington clearly put his ass on the line and alongside some others. Um, Ethan Allen would be another. But regardless, most of these people we call the architects of the country did not really do a lot of fighting themselves. They were not willing to put their asses on the line. They wanted others, perhaps people of a lower class or socioeconomic status, to go die. It's reminiscent of, of the very good uh, early 2000s system of a down song. Uh, B.O.B. Why do they always send the poor? Well, I think we know the answer to that. They're, they're not willing to sacrifice their own skins for these types of gains. They will sacrifice the skins of those that are lower than them um, on the proverbial pyramid, which is about as cowardly as you can get. So anyway, let's keep going. Thomas Jefferson is called to draw up a declaration, not the famous one quite yet, the, this one's called the Declaration on Causes and Necessity of Taking Up Arms. I think I briefly mentioned it in the last episode, um, and I'll only briefly mention it now. It's not super thrilling. Uh, they also end up issuing $2 million in continental currency, uh, which is a, a really good idea, except for the fact that it was not backed by really anything. It's backed by faith, which is, uh, we could argue most currencies are really only backed by faith. Even gold and silver or whatever precious metals we think back them, that's also just – that's a construct. They're just metals, relatively useless metals, so it still takes a lot of mental gymnastics to think there's any value there, but it seems to work. They convince most of us idiots to use their currency or their precious metal and attach some sort of status to it, and we're willing to fight and die so that we can have some of this stuff. Uh, unfortunately, in this case – uh, people weren't ready to bite off on the two million new dollars in continental currency, so it was relatively worthless. It's like monopoly money, but hey, it made them feel good. Now, enough me being negative for just a second. Let me be positive. It was kind of a good idea to at least try to establish this currency, even if it wasn't wildly effective, because what you're doing here from a social movement standpoint is creating a new symbol of power. You're creating your own legitimacy while basically uh, 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 turning a blind eye to the legit legitimacy of your oppressor, in this case, British pounds, right? So it was at least a good attempt from a social movement standpoint, even though it ended up kind of backfiring. I'm trying to be at least some semi-balanced for once in my life. While it didn't work, I actually have to give them credit for at least attempting this. Um, while they're exploring both war and peace, uh, British uh, leaders Thomas Gage and William Howe send 2,500 troops to take Bunker Hill on June 16th of 1775, just outside of Charleston, Massachusetts. And Bunker Hill ends up being a victory for the British, but a very hard-fought one. They experience as many as 1,026 casualties, uh, merely trying to, that's, I mean, that's almost half their troops, merely trying to take this hill, and it took them three attempts. So even though it is a defeat for the uh, Patriot cause and a victory for the, uh, the, the British, it's actually kind of a, a military defeat in terms of morale as far as the British are concerned, and it actually gives the Patriots a boost. How's that possible? How's it possible to give them a boost? Because they, yeah. like you, like we talked about before, they have zero chance of winning this war, but they just slaughtered the British, even though the British technically gained the territory, the Bunker Hill. Yeah. They slaughtered half their troops in this battle, which probably none of them were, neither sides were expecting. Right. I mean, it's it's one of those cliches we even hear in sports all the time. It is a moral, this loss somehow becomes a moral victory, right? Okay. Um, it's around this time that Thomas Paine, uh, Thomas Paine's common sense eventually starts making the rounds. I, oh, actually, it's well after that, but, but we already have an entire episode on Thomas Paine, so make sure you listen to that. It's one of our, one of my personal favorite episodes we've done so far. Um, 
It's in this atmosphere that we also get the more famous declaration from Thomas Jefferson, the Declaration of Independence. By May of 1776, the only holdout colonies that were, I mean, and when I say holdout, holdout in terms of wanting to go to war with Britain were Pennsylvania, New York, Maryland, and South Carolina. And the main thing that was keeping these colonies from from wanting to really just go all out and, and join the war effort was that they were waiting for French support. So I mentioned it in the intro today that without, in this case, another European empire to really help them fight this war against the British, they weren't going to win. And so these colonies wanted to make sure that they could get French support. Why would the French be a natural ally? I mean, it's kind of funny to think about them as an ally because bearing in mind like 20 years earlier, these colonists wanted to fight the French to get the Ohio Valley. And in fact, that's the, that's the jumping off point for this whole freaking mess we're talking about here was this war with the French and the Native Americans. And now all of a sudden they're looking to the French for help. Why? The French hate the British. Oh, yes. Yeah, the French and British at this point in history had already fought in 462 different wars. I just made that number up. Do not look that up. But, but it's it's I exaggerate because it really is. They've been fighting wars, 30 years wars, 100 years wars. Like, I mean, there is there is bad blood there, as Taylor Swift would say. And the other thing that's crucial is that the one thing that the Americans did not have, the French had, and they were incredibly strong in that, which was a Navy. Perfect. Absolutely. They're going to need this Navy. Um, and by June, Henry Lee of Virginia had already issued a resolution calling for independence. So it's not like even Thomas Jefferson's declaration itself was some sort of watershed moment. Um, different colonies, again, in this case, Virginia had already issued resolutions that were calling for it by July. Only the New York representatives were still against war. So that means Pennsylvania, Maryland, and South Carolina had basically fallen in line. Jefferson is called to draft this very famous declaration. It is well known, and he issues his 24 grievances against the king. It's one of the primary sources I will not read from in this podcast because it is so well known. You all are, in fact, I'll read other people's critiques of it later on in, in this series, but I'm not going to read it now. We know. We know. Everybody's equal. We want some, per there's a pursuit of happiness in there somewhere. I don't know. Is there, is that, is that in this document? What do you think? It is. Yeah, it might be. Whatever. Um, I'm going to pause for a second though on the all men line. There was some of the slave rhetoric that had made its way into the Declaration of Independence. And when I say slave rhetoric, that was this completely unfounded, wildly offensive rhetoric that the colonists themselves were feeling enslaved by parliament or by the king because of, again, this taxation. And uh, in fact, that slave rhetoric was removed so that people would not get confused that they were not talking about actual slaves, that these fake-ass slaves, because they have to pay a tax are not the same as the real slaves. They definitely want to make sure that they can keep their actual slaves. So there should be no confusion between what type of slave they're talking about. Um, so at some point, and, it, and I must explain that the measure to remove all that slave rhetoric came from both the Georgia and South Carolina representatives for obvious reasons, right? Their economies are based on the subjugation and oppression of slaves. So they wanted no confusion there that we're talking about taxation. We're not talking about slavery. There is no, slavery is not going anywhere. The vote for independence took place on July 2nd of 1760, uh, 1776. It's ratified on July 4th, and the official famous copy um, on display was signed on August 2nd. So technically, we could have uh, selected any of those dates to celebrate uh, the United States independence. Uh, it's all irrelevant. There's a lot of research into why we chose the 4th, and in a Myth is America podcast, maybe it deserves a little bit of exploration, but for me, it's super boring. It's not one of the more exciting myths in American history. Cool, we just selected a random day for the holiday. It's There's no consequences to this myth, in my personal opinion, and I'm assuming Nick agrees with me on that one, so we won't go any further into that myth. Um, George Washington, though, uh, as this new commander-in-chief, assumes authority and immediately tries to whip a new army into shape. Now, the easy converts or the easy people that he's going to have involved in this are the idealized and uh, highly unorganized militias. The militias are already fighting. They're willing to get on board, Minutemen, etc. The militias are ready to go. 
but that's not going to be enough. He needs a formal army, and he wants to do it, ironically enough, along the British model, right? He himself had served in the British military, so he wants a British-style military, and the militias are not going to be able to meet all of his needs, so he wants to get a, a real army together. So by 1776, he began, and Congress also agrees, to entice these soldiers with cash bounties, clothes, and blankets, and extended furloughs for as long as one-year terms. So basically, initially, they're like, yeah, everybody's going to be on board with our movement. Everyone's got to hate the British as much as us. Well, he, they were wrong. So they tried to find these incentives. Again, cash bounties, clothes, blankets, and short one-year terms. I mean, that seems almost arrogant that they think this thing's going to be like a year against the British Empire. Regardless, it doesn't work. So by 1777, Congress mandated some new incentives, that there would be a three-year enlistment, and you would get, as a prospective soldier, $20 of this new continental currency that you already know is worth almost nothing. nothing. Yeah. Right, you would wipe your ass with it. Um, But, and here, there's a big but, if the war goes longer— then three years, you get a bonus of 100 acres of land for fighting the entire war. That's actually a pretty good incentive. Now, I'm going to spoil it already, but unfortunately, most people, most soldiers, most veterans are not going to get what they're promised. And we'll read some from primary sources later on um, in this series that are pissed. They never got their 100 acres. They put their butts on the line for the independence of the United States against the British uh, because they were promised something and weird, the new government didn't give it to them. They never got their land. Um, it will also lead to various forms of rebellion, which Nick will be going into detail in, I, th I want to say, two episodes from now. Okay. Because this wasn't working, George Washington urged, urged conscription. What's conscription, Nick? Forced joining of the army. Yeah, like drafting in these people, oftentimes against their will, these young men, and in fact, not always young men. Sources have uh, people as young as 16 and as old as 50 serving in the Continental Army during this war. Um, but yeah, forcing these people to fight uh, for their cause. And again, when I say there, Washington, at least I give him credit for being willing to fight himself, but these other guys that are just hanging out in places like Philadelphia and Boston not willing to do any of the fighting themselves, yeah, they're forcing these other people to do their dirty work. Uh, which is wildly questionable. Um, anyway, he says the government must have recourse to coercive measures. That's his quote. The government must have recourse to coercive measures. So in other words, he wants to give the government power to force these people, impress them into military service. And if they somehow are not able to agree, he wants to punish them. What do you think of that? Like, we're always told about, oh my god, everybody must have just jumped on board to willingly fight the tyrannical British, and here we're seeing, nope, we're going to force people to do it, and if they don't do it, we're going to punish the hell out of them. Yeah, I think it it's just a perfect example of one of the main myths of the founding of the country. Like you said, we assume that everyone was just gung-ho on board, ready to join the army to fight the British, but we find out when you uncover enough that... They couldn't even put an army together. People wanted nothing to do with fighting in this war. The enlistment quotas were never met. Like, never. I'm talking through the whole war, through 1783. They were never met. They never met their enlistment quotas. A good portion of that army was conscripts and draftees. In 1778, the northern states got so desperate that they even began to do something they said they would never do. Congress and George Washington himself, commander-in-chief, had... Uh, basically forbidden the acceptance of any African-American troops or black troops, had forbidden it. He did not want to have to lead them, did not want his officers to have to lead them, which again shows how wildly racist this man is, that we put on our money and carve his face into mountains. He owned human beings. We already know he's a, 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 a prominent slave owner. He refused. He refused to have these African-Americans who were willing to fight. These were people that were trying to join. He refused to allow them into the army until 1778 when they got so desperate that some of the northern states began to enlist for free black troops. And the only reason he eventually agreed is because the British had already been doing it. Lord Dunmore had offered freedom to all slaves that were joining the British side. They even created like this wildly effective fighting unit known as the Ethiopian Regiment. So the British had. So George Washington was willing to accept these black troops only because the British were using it against the colonies and offering people their freedom. Um, 
So some examples of patriot, patriotic African Americans that would join the Continental Army included William Lee, Francis Marion, and of course, most notably uh, for war historians would be the 1st Rhode Island Regiment. Um, why do you think these 5,000 troops, though, were willing to fight for, I mean, a society that was subjugating them? Why do you, I mean, what, what was the incentive there? The only thing that I can ever come up with is that they were fighting for a better America that would be freedom for everyone. Even though they themselves already had their freedom, they were fighting for a freer society where they would be less subjugated and the slaves would perhaps be free. And there had to be a better vision of the future, right? They had to assume that that this slave legacy and this oppression would not last the next, well, slavery the next century, but oppression, we would argue, through today. Yeah, totally. They had to assume that something new would at least alleviate some, and it never did. It never did. More false, more broken promises, false hopes. Okay. Um, countless women also served in supportive roles and traveled with the troops. So sometimes lost on uh, a lot of people that, that think about this war is that the women actually, many, many of the uh, uh, regiments had entire bands of women, entire towns, like following them around and setting up these camps. And the women that, that worked there served uh, as far as like supportive roles, uh, nursing, uh, feeding the soldiers, caring for them, emotional support roles. <clears throat> and contrary to popular belief, even sometimes some combat roles. Deborah Sampson's story is actually pretty fascinating. We might even have a little mini episode on her coming up, but in case we don't, she went so far, and I think I mentioned her with the Daughters of Liberty as well, she went so far as to uh, initially pretend to be a male so that she could fight uh, for the colonists against the British oppression. She was so willing to put her ass on the line, unlike, again, some of the architects of this country, that she uh, uh, dressed up like a man. Um, however, even with all these measures, there was still not that much support for the war. Um, so intimidation and the serve or traitor mantra became very important, uh, to fill out the ranks of the Continental Army. And I'm now going to look at one of the great sources that like kind of goes through, it's a secondary source that goes through how George Washington was able to create the Continental Army, um, with conscripts and draftees and unorganized militias and how he was able to actually keep everybody in line through enforcement. So it's not like some sort of like, you know, awesome utopia. This is through enforcement. And I'm going to read from uh, this secondary source. It's called George Washington and George Washington's Enforcers uh, Policing the Continental Army. It is a, a, a historiography written by Harry M. Ward. And I'm going to read a couple of excerpts here. He says, it was decided that, like civil society, the armed forces should establish a basic code that would provide guidelines for dispensing justice. An irony was that the code of rules for the revolutionary, revolutionary army contained a lengthy categorization of liabilities and punishments to be incurred from misbehavior of officers and soldiers with very slight attention given to creating a fair legal process. It was also an irony that the military code of any army fighting for American liberty was grounded in the denying of liberty in military society. That's a pretty fiery quote there from, from Harry Ward. What do you think of that, Nick? Yeah, I think it, you know, we're deconstructing the myths here. That's what we're doing. He goes on to say that their inspiration for this was the British military, which Washington, even though, again, he's fighting the British, he looked to them for his inspiration in just about every regard. He says it was fitting for an emerging republic to have its military code created by congressional legislation. Historically, in Great Britain, articles of war were issued by the crown. Parliament, however, in the Mutiny Act of 1689, reserved for itself authority to establish military law during peacetime. The crown continued to declare military rules and regulation during wartime. By a law of 1712, the crown was given authority to extend its military code to troops abroad. Six years later, Parliament conferred on the British sovereign the responsibility of declaring articles of war for troops at home and abroad and during times of war and peace. The reason that's important is George Washington is going to kind of assume that same type of authority of almost like a sovereign, like a king. He's viewing himself a, a little bit like a king. In fact, I mean, this is where titles like his high mightiness that he actually, whether or not he adopted them or people conferred them, like this is where they come from him, is him basically operating as an autocrat of this military. Anyway, as we kind of carry on, um, by June 30th of 1775, I'm also going to read from Harry Ward here, 
This is These are his words, not mine. Most of the 69 provisions repeated verbatim in the Massachusetts Military Code of April 7075 were adopted. As in the Massachusetts Code, soldiers were expected to attend divine service and refrain from profanity upon penalty of a fine. So that's not like the worst of the worst that we're going to get to here, but just I, I want your commentary as the sociologist here. These soldiers have to attend divine service to serve in the Continental Army? What the hell's going on here? Yeah, they're required to go to church and to refrain from cursing or face a fine. I mean, they're just trying to control behavior and get them in line at this point. No, inf- no offenses involving internal army discipline were capital crimes. Only abandonment of a post and un- unauthorized giving away of a password merited the death penalty. I want I want listeners to remember that because the death penalty, we're, g- we're going to be looking at an example of that here in just a second. Interestingly, desertion, mutiny, sedition, and treasonable activities were cited as non-capital offenses, the punishment of which was left to the discretion of courts martial. That's what it's supposed to be as the war is starting. Again, they're adopting these even before the, like all the way back in 1775. The commander in chief could pardon culprits sentenced by a court martial. Regimental commanders could do the same for persons convicted under a regimental court martial. Pre trial confinement was limited to eight days or until a court martial could be convened. Additional articles of war adopted by Congress, not included in the Massachusetts Code, treated such areas as furloughs, musters, and sutlers. Article 51, more explicit as to punishment than the Massachusetts Code, stated that no person shall be sentenced by a court-martial to suffer death except in the cases expressly mentioned in the foregoing articles, nor shall any punishment be inflicted at the discretion of a court-martial other than degrading, cashiering, drumming out of the army, whipping, not exceeding 39 lashes, fine, not exceeding two months of pay for the offender, imprisonment, not exceeding one month. Hopefully you remember what I just said, because we're about to get to an example of where this is obscenely violated here in just a second. I think the 39 lashes is funny to me, because it's like 40 would just be egregious, but 39, <laughs> but 39 is yeah. the right number, right number. Anyway, these oh, are- Oh, actually, I just see now this next sentence. It says, the 39 lashes represented the maximum sanctioned in the Bible. So, well, I mean, we're seeing the clear correlation yeah. here. Like, that's what we're seeing. Okay, so- When we look at this and we understand that a good portion um, of these uh, uh, people didn't even want to be there. Like I said, they are conscripted or they are draftees. Um, They don't want to be there. And yet we also understand that both Congress and the commander in chief acting in this case as somewhat of an autocrat is basically creating codes of conduct for how this, this, this is going to work. So, I mean, I guess I should reframe this. Let's imagine we are an everyday individual living in colonial America or we're British citizens, whatever we want to identify our, our, ourselves as. And, uh, and then all of a sudden, out of nowhere, we are heavily pressured into uh, basically joining the military um, socially. If that doesn't work, then our choices are give, taken away from us because, again, George Washington got the coercive measures passed in Congress. So then we're just outright conscripted. So we're basically there against our will, and we're supposed to put our lives on the line for a bunch of rich guys that have never taken us into account before. And we have no formal military training because we weren't with one of the militias. How are we supposed to know what the codes of conduct are and what war is like and all of the horrors of even following orders? I mean, that's in fact, we came here from England to have quote unquote freedom and liberty and not to have to follow a bunch of people's orders. It must be very difficult. And so we're going to look at an account here, a primary source. Um, from a man named Samuel Dewey's, who recounts the suppression of insubordination in the Continental Army after the mutinies of 1781. Now, I want to, again, frame this in a way that's, a, that, that, that's very clear. Mutinies, and I think most of our listeners know what a mutiny is, occur when the actual officer, commanding officers in charge, are overthrown by their own troops and, new off, and basically they either desert or lead their own uh, uh, regiment or company into battle. Like, that's what a mutiny is. But the term mutiny was very, very, very liberal under the Continental Army because, as we just read, one of the only ways that you could uh, execute your own troops is if they were performing mutiny. And so mutineers would be executed. So sometimes even the smallest, like, little slip-up could get you accused of mutiny. And again, it's a slip-up you might not be aware of because you're an everyday citizen that ha- that has, again, no military training, doesn't even want to be there. 
etc. This is where we get to Samuel Dewey's recount of a suppression of insubordination in the Continental Army. Um, he gives us the story, and I'm only going to read excerpts here because we don't have time to go through his entire uh, couple of pages of this account. So I'm going to read excerpts. But he gives us a story of a man named, or excuse me, nicknamed Macaroni Jack. So Macaroni Jack is interesting. He is uh, a very intelligent, active, neat, and clever fellow, had committed some trivial offense. He had his wife with him in camp, who always kept him very clean and neat in his appearance. She was a washerwoman to a number of soldiers, myself among the number. She was a very well-behaved and good-conditioned woman. So Samuel Dewey clearly likes his, his fellow soldier here, Macaroni Jack. He likes his wife. Um, and he committed, again, a trivial offense, as far as Samuel Dewey is concerned. He goes on to say that the officers, for the purpose of making an impression upon him and to better his conduct, ordered him to be brought from the guardhouse, which done, he was tied up and drummers ordered to give him a certain number of lashes upon his bare back. The intention of the officers was not to chastise him. So we assume it might even be the 39 lashes we just got done talking about. Dewey's doesn't count them, but that's what we assume. When he was tied up, he looked around and addressed the soldiers, exclaiming at the same time, Dear brother soldiers, won't you help me? So this man, not used to military life, tied up, about to receive his 39 lashes, obviously does not want to receive his 39 lashes, he doesn't even want to be there, asks for help. Like, that, that's just, I, I, I firmly believe that is a natural reaction when you are being tied up and about to be whipped that, like, you're, what do you, you just lay there and take it. I think most people would scream, yell something. That's what he does. To get back to the source, this, in the eyes of the officers, savored of mutiny, and they called out, take him down, take him down. The order was instantly obeyed, and he was taken back to the guardhouse again and handcuffed. At this time, there were two deserters confined with him. So these deserters were also going to be held with him, and we know based on the rules we just heard, it can't be for longer for lo longer than eight days. Okay, I'm going to skip ahead a little bit here until we get to the point where they're going to uh, basically start marching these guys out for their sentence. The distance of about, uh, excuse me, the whole body, sentinels, invalids, etc., accepted, when formed, were marched to the distance of about a half mile from the camp, and there made to stand under arms. Twenty men were then ordered out of line and formed into marching order, and all the musicians placed at their head. After remaining a short time in marching posture, the order of forward was given. We were then marched direct to the jail door. The prisoners, six in number, were then brought out, and their sentence, which was death, was read to them. Keep in mind, we just went through the rules as outlined in the secondary source by Harry, uh, Harry Ward that, that death was not supposed to be that common. Um, in fact, it was supposed to be less common than what it was under the Articles of War in England. It was supposed to, they were supposed to quote-unquote improve upon that, but what we see here is it is being used relatively liberally here. So they line these guys up. And I'm going to get back to the quote here. The officer in command then divided his force of 20 men into two platoons. The whole was then ordered to load their pieces. This done, 10 were ordered to advance. And at the signal given by the officer, which was the wave of his pocket handkerchief, the first platoon of 10 fired at one of the six. Macaroni Jack was the first shot and was instantly killed. The first platoon was then ordered to retire and reload, and the second platoon of 10 ordered to advance. When the signal was again given, Smith shared the same fate, but with an awfulness that would have made even devils to have shrunk back and stood appalled. His head was literally blown in fragments from off of his body. The second platoon was then ordered to retire and reload, whilst the first was ordered to advance at the same signal fired at the third man. The second platoon that advanced and fired to order at Sergeant Lilly, whose brave and noble soul was instantly on the wing to the presence of that supreme judge, who has pledged himself he will do that which is right." He goes on and on, and they continue this process, right? One line steps up, fires, executes a soldier. They go back. New line comes up, executes the next soldier. And they do this for all six of these soldiers. There are six people executed this day. What do you think of that? I mean, we don't know what the other five, I guess, did. Well, two but of them we were deserved, know, yeah. yeah. We know, based on at least this testimony, that all that Macaroni Jack did was ask for help when he was about to get whipped, and that constituted mutiny, I guess, in the eyes of their uh, leader. And this is in George Washington's army. Um, I asked this question, uh, and I will continue in classes or in this podcast dozens of times. 
how does this get left out of the U.S. narrative? How does this get left out? I mean, I think it's obvious. We don't want to paint this guy. Uh, even though he does not order directly these executions, it's his army. Like, we don't want to paint this guy as anything but, like, some sort of, like, great white savior or something like this. But, again, and, and here's the thing. People will listen to this podcast and be like, well, that's just – I mean, even the British did that. Clearly, they borrowed the articles from the British and the French did it and don't even get us started on the Red Army during World War II and just executing anybody that ran away. But that's fine. Those were all examples that people usually point to to how awful those other places are. What we're showing here is that the United States, in its foundation, was also doing those things. Samuel Dewey's goes on to say, So near did they stand, these are the people firing, the firing squad, so near did they stand that the handkerchiefs covering the eyes of some of them that were shot were set on fire. The fence and even the heads of rye for some distance between the feet or some distance within the field were covered over with blood and brains. They then begin to march the rest of the troops away. Keep in mind, they brought all the troops there to make sure they watched this. They then begin to march them away. The order was for every man to look upon the bodies as he passed, and in order that the soldiers in the line might behold them more distinctly in passing, they were ordered to countermarch after they had passed and then marched as close to them upon their return. So not only do they march them past the dead bodies, bodies once, they march them back so that they can look at these dead bodies. What are they doing here? Yeah, they're making an example of these six executed soldiers. Yeah, this is intimidation. They're intimidating their own troops. And mutiny was a thing, right? This is in, in response to the various mutinies of seven, uh, 1881, and the one he's referencing, or at least the most famous one, would be the Pennsylvania Line Mutiny, which took place on January 1st of 1881, and that 1781? mutiny— 1781? 1781. What did I say? 1881. Oh, okay. Well, 1781. And, and these people were mutinying, not trying to like overthrow their officers or even actually even leave the military. They weren't even trying to desert. They just wanted higher pay and better housing conditions. Uh, it shows how poorly treated these troops were. They're treated poorly during the war. They're executed during the war. And again, we're going to get to some examples in a future podcast where they're not even given what they're promised for serving the most patriotic cause in U.S. history, the freedom from, from England. They are not compensated for that. And in fact, in some cases, when we get to Daniel Shays, they're punished for it. Ah, anyway, the, the Pennsylvania line mutiny actually ends in a relatively se uh, a peaceful settlement. But it does go on to inspire the Pompton mutiny, which took place in New Jersey. And that one also ended in, in executions. Um, again, this, this is not the the conflict that it's always made out to be where everybody's on board and the war effort uh, goes as smoothly as we've all been told. And at this point, they're not even winning the war. They're actually losing, which is probably why tensions are so high. Moderate colonists begin to issue, uh, begin to call to issue the Olive Branch Petition uh, that ends up, uh, basically the Olive Branch Petition, to paraphrase it super quickly, is a petition that they're trying to create an olive branch with the king. They actually reach to directly to the queen, king, uh, circumscribing or uh, going around circumnavigating parliament. Basically, the Olive Branch Petition more or less blames parliament for the current issues that these two entities are experiencing, the colonies in England, and they think that if they can negotiate directly with King George that they might be able to solve this conflict. He rejects it. Maybe he should have looked a little bit harder at it, but he decides to reject it. As far as the war itself... Uh, I'm not, we've already said we're not going to spend a lot of time on military history, but one thing that I do want to emphasize is England's not fighting a very winnable war here. Um, like initially we've kind of talked about how just defeating some patriots and suppressing a, a rebellion might be kind of easy in some ways. In other ways, it's hard. And I want to kind of explain or explore why it might be hard. First thing is you're you're entering into this engagement with the mindset that if you win, these are your people. You will have to rule over them again. So you actually have to fight more or less with one hand tied behind your back. You cannot unleash the full destructive forces of your empire upon these colonies because if you do, A, you'll like destroy infrastructure and all kinds of things that you kind of want to use in the future and you may make like permanent enemies forever. So it's almost like you're trying to fight a, a nice war. What do you think of that? Yeah, I think that you yeah, you nailed it. Like they don't want to go in and just completely obliterate these people and everything they've built. Like they're British citizens at this point still, you know what yeah, I mean? Yeah. They could have and they just yeah. but yes. 
The other thing that is actually interesting is there was no way to secure a a victory for the British in terms of like seizing anything, if that makes sense. So in classical warfare, like that classical, excuse me, around the Napoleonic era, one thing that you wanted to do is seize like these very important places and that's how you secure victory so like a capital city would be an example well there was no capital city for the british to like seize and begin to readminister their empire from so by not having this specific definable target that could basically cut the head off the snake it put them at somewhat of a disadvantage the other thing uh they had very long supply lines dating going all the way back across the atlantic now because they're not going to get nearly as much support uh in the colonies um and that's actually going to be where the French come in, and they make those supply lines even more uh, uh, problematic with their navy. Um, they also were hoping to use the loyalists of New York uh, colony and what they thought they had in the southern colonies to divide and conquer New England, where much of the hotbed of the action was. And in this case, the British uh, clearly overestimated how much their loyalists were willing to do for them in both New York and in the American South. Um, as early as 1775, Philip Schuyler had charged Ethan Allen and Benedict Arnold with also heading north towards Canada, which actually was kind of an interesting strategy that the colony I, – I will give them credit here – trying to actually get the Canadians to also help them fight the British, uh, the French Canadians, seemed like a good strategy actually. you think they would naturally want to help. It didn't really work out well. They sent propaganda to Quebec urging them to join the resistance to the British. Um and it is – I guess I kind of flew through it, but it is that Benedict Arnold that ends up kind of working for both sides. Um, Allen initially fails in Montreal, but it's later occupied without a shot by Richard Montgomery anyway. Quebec itself actually never falls to the Americans, um, but it's interesting. The war, again, carries on for the next couple of years. You've got important stories that, like, again, just if I were doing a timeline, you've got Washington capturing some Hessians on December 26th of 1776, the very famous uh, Christmas uh, situation with George Washington. Um, you also have uh, – well, actually, I want to pause here for just a moment. As the war carried on, there was an infectious movement of patriotism, and the reason this is important is specific committees were formed. Um, both locally and quote unquote nationally, I don't like to use that word because the nation state hasn't formed yet, but it's whatever. Colonially, it is nationally sounds better than that. Committees were formed to enforce boycotts, impress people into militias, and seize munitions from loyalists. So these are like these are basically committees that aren't operating under any like governmental structure. These are just like everyday super patriotic citizens that are going out and accosting their other fellow citizens. Like you're going to join our militia whether you like it or not. And we heard that you're a loyalist, so now we're going to take your farm and shit. Like that was actually happening also during this war. It was highly encouraged um, in many areas, especially the South. Um, it was wildly invasive and it was predicated heavily on fear mongering. Um, and of course, uh, the tried and true methodology of tarring and feathering also continued throughout this time period. Some sources estimate that the loyalist population was like as high as 20%. It might have been, um, but yeah, it, it, it really, it's not that it matters. They didn't play nearly as big a role as the British were hoping, um, were hoping that they would. Uh, and again, the war just kind of rages on. It moves north, it moves west, uh, it moves south. Uh, and again, we're kind of kind of fly through some some of this here until we get to uh, one thing I kind of want to focus on for just a moment is the the role that Joseph Brandt, uh, a Mohawk sachem, would play. And again, as we've talked about in prior episodes, and we're going to continue to to talk about in future episodes, Native Americans, uh, arguably, inarguably, some of the most oppressed people in human history, uh, full ethnic cleansing, are always forced during these European wars, and in this case, we're calling this a European war, to choose between the lesser of two evils, right? In the French and Indian War, it was the French. Um, now, between the British and the Americans, they have to choose between the lesser of two evils. And the fact that most of them chose the British, who are like the most wildly just awful, awful col col colonial masters anyone could ever wish upon the world, the fact that they chose the British shows how absolutely disgusting the Americans were to them and how wildly offensive they were to their sensibilities. Like, that is, that is a statement. Like, when, 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 it, when a colonized person chooses the British to side with in any conflict, that's, that's, a, that's a major statement. Um, and, of course, this leads to uh, George Washington issuing one of his most famous orders that makes him even more controversial figure in the eyes of many. Um, and I'm going to read it verbatim. 
these are George Washington's orders to John Sullivan. Um, and his orders are uh, basically they take place on May 31st of 1779. And his orders are basically to the Mohawk are part of the Iroquois League of Peace and Power. But George Washington wants all of the Iroquois uh, gone. He says, and I quote, the immediate objectives are the total destruction and devastation of their settlements and the capture of as many prisoners of every age and sex as possible. It will be essential to ruin their crops now in the ground and prevent their planting more. It's just a sentence, and he goes on further in the letter that he writes to uh, Sullivan um, with a little bit less strong language. But this is a call for what? Ethnic cleansing. George Washington, this is an official call for ethnic cleansing by George Washington. We put this fucking guy on money, and he calls for ethnic cleansing. This guy becomes the first leader. I, I, it's just, it's, it's mind blowing to me. It is mind blowing to me because he's not talking about combatants. He's not just talking about Joseph Brandt. He's talking about going to the villages where the elderly, the women, children, doesn't matter. Going to the villages and burning them to the ground and catching every age, every sex, imprisoning them, enslaving them. And destroying all of their crops. So, so they, they have... can never come back. Yep. This is ethnic cleansing. George Washington called for ethnic cleansing. I will repeat it one more time. George Washington called for ethnic cleansing, and it was carried out. We revere this guy here. This is America. What do you think of that? Yeah, I mean, I have no words. It's absurd. Need a minute. I'm pretty... I always get fired up when I think about this. Um, Yeah. Sullivan shows up with 4,500 troops to take on the Six Nations and the Six Nations again in, in, in the Six Nations, Mohawk, Seneca, Cayuga, Oneida, Onondaga. Um, I don't know who I'm missing in here. Um, Tuscarora. Did I get six? I think so. Okay. Anyway, he's taking on the Six Nations. 45 troops bring the terror. All treaties are then broken with uh, a few of the Western nations to include the Shawnee. And it's important to understand that the survivors, the refugees, because that's what they are, the refugees of this crisis in the Northeast are all going to have to flee. And when they flee, they're going to flee into the Ohio Valley. And the reason I'm mentioning that now is because that sets us up for a future episode when there will be a resistance that arises in the Ohio Valley. And again, we must understand that U.S. policy – creates immigration crises because that's what this is. You are forcing people from their home to into other people's homes. In this case, yes, if you're Iroquois or, or Wampanoag or Mohegan and you're a survivor from the East Coast and you're forced to then go into the Ohio Valley and seek refuge with the Miami or the Delaware or whoever's there, that's a crisis. That's a problem, right? The Miami and the Delaware might be welcoming some of them or might be fighting some of them, but they don't have the means to absorb this type of refugee crisis. And again, this is just ignored over and over and over again in U.S. history. The manufacture of refugee crises. And then the, the, the absolutely ignorant policies that we t tie into them are uh, all associated with immigration. But again, we'll kind of see this theme throughout this podcast. Okay. Um, anyway, I'm going to fast forward through the Southern strategy here because I, I'm not even going to fast forward through it. There was a Southern strategy and I'm moving on. Um, the French end up joining during this time period and end up basically saving the day. And that's kind of what I want to focus on here. Initially, the French uh, began uh, as the suppliers of arms during this war uh, and munitions and helping out with ports and other crucial supplies because France still had ports in the Caribbean as well. Um, in fact, without some of this stuff, the great battle, the turning point, the Battle of Saratoga, uh, would have been an absolute loss for the colonists. Um, the Treaty of Alliance is officially signed between France and the U.S. colonies uh, in uh, on February 6th of 1778. For those that are curious, that makes technically the French the first to recognize the United States as an independent entity. So uh, all those people that consistently have an issue with the French, usually of a certain political persuasion, can kind of eat that. Um, the operations that the French provide, as Nick already asserted, are primarily naval. See, the colonists don't have a navy at all, but the French do. They have a badass navy, and they're going to need it because the British also have a badass navy. Um, also, keeping uh, they keep basically the British navy occupied in other theaters and makes uh, getting supplies 
uh, into British hands uh, on the coast much more difficult. Uh, leaders such as Rochambeau uh, end up really leading a charge. He lands at Newport uh, in the, with 6,000 troops. He meets up with George Washington in Connecticut in 1781. Um, de Grasse is one of the admirals. I don't Actually, I don't know that I should give him that position. I don't know what position de Grasse is. Maybe we should Google it. Anyway, he ends up patrolling uh, the waters um, along the coast. And the invasion of the Chesapeake is where, where things really get interesting as far as French help. Rochambeau and Washington lead their troops to meet up with the Marquis de Lafayette, one of history's most famous figures, not only for what he did here in the colonies, but for the revolution he's going to play a huge part in in France. Um, they all meet up and they attack on the ground. Um, and de Grasse ends up bringing in the Navy to form a blockade at the Chesapeake. And if you're wondering why I'm doing this little part of military strategy is because basically this is what breaks, this is the straw that breaks the camel's back. This is what uh, basically after King's Mountain, um, the King's Mountain Battle, General Cornwallis was forced to go north into Virginia towards the Chesapeake. And after a couple of small victories, he ends up being surrounded by these forces and he never can get any of his uh, re reinforcements because of the blockade formed at Chesapeake. So again, for the military historians that know that Yorktown is basically the end of, of fighting, uh, major fighting uh, on the East Coast, and it's where Cornwallis eventually signs surrender. Well, the only reason that happens, what I'm trying to say, is because of the French. That's the only reason it takes place. They're able to surround him um, and and basically starve him out and disease him out because disease was spreading through his troops as well. So basically, uh, he's stuck. Um, and he signs the surrender on October 19th of 1781. Fighting continues for a couple of more years, um, uh, both in the north, uh, especially in New York City, and uh, far out west. But for our purposes, again, there's nothing really of note here. The Treaty of Paris is officially signed on September 2nd of 1783, and it basically provides formal recognition uh, of an independent United States among at least the European powers that cared, right? Um, a clear border is drawn at the Mississippi River. I'm emphasizing that because that river, that border, just like after the French and Indian War, is going to be a cause of strife between the newly formed United States and, of course, the people that fucking lived here, the Native Americans, and what they're promised. Again, also of note, this is the second Treaty of Paris now. Again, the first one was after the French and Indian War. Who's not invited to Paris to hang out and talk about, like, what's happening to their land? Yeah, the natives that already lived here. Yeah, all of the nations that already lived here. So, again, the funny part of this, and, and it's not – I don't know that it's funny, but – the way I kind of like to frame it when I talk about it is think about how in the 1700s, how awkward this had to be, though, like at the end, like the Native American issue is going to come up here uh, in a few episodes when we talk about Tecumseh and stuff like that. But the other thing we have to think about is, I mean, it's just got to be so awkward that like you're a British troop or a British merchant or a loyalist or a Tory or whatever, and you you, you just got to got to hang out because like this is 1700s, nothing happens super quick after you lose this war and the Treaty of Paris is signed and you're just like hanging out with these people and they're looking at you and you're looking at them and you have to just kind of have to wait to leave. It's just like this slow like process of like breaking up, like they're breaking up together. <laughs> it's like a slow, like they have to live together, like the British are living in the basement now and they're, they have to you finish know, out their lease. And yeah. Whatever. <laughs> yeah, it's so weird like that. <laughs> like so that had to be kind of awkward. Uh, uh, but all kidding aside, an another important aspect that we will be coming back to as well that's often overlooked during this time period is uh, slaves. So the British, as I already mentioned, had promised freedom to a lot of slaves. In some cases, they actually followed through, especially the ones that made it to Canada. The ones that went to the Caribbean, it was a little bit less – uh, clear how many were actually granted their freedom and how many unfortunately ended up in other British colonies as slaves again. Let's just say that not all of them earned their freedom. So do we give the British a pat on the back for fulfilling their promise? Uh, we don't, but we give them maybe a little tap on the head. I don't know what we give them, but they did more than the United States did afterwards. So I guess we do have to give them credit for that. And they end up abolishing slavery altogether about four decades before the Americans. So there is that. Anyway, we're closing out with the actual like war part. We're not done talking about the American War for Independence and all of its manifestations, but I mean, we really wanted in this episode to try and uh, kind of outline a couple important things that are overlooked during the combat period. So in recap, like the idea that the army had to be formed through uh, coercion, conscription, 
um, and uh, and drafting that not everybody was on board with fighting and how awful uh, the treatment could be for the continental troops. Again, these people that end up putting their asses on the line for the independence of the United States are treated pretty poorly by their own uh, leadership. So we want to outline that. We also out- want to outline the fact that uh, the French really save the day here. The French really do save the day. I mean, it's so overlooked in U.S. history. We basically just think, oh my God, guerrilla warfare, some Minutemen, Paul Revere, yeah, George Washington kicks the British ass. That's what we're taught. We're never taught that this war is an absolute loss without the French. Why don't we want to give the French credit? I mean, it obviously takes away uh, from the narrative of the heroic colonists fighting against the British Empire. As soon as you throw the French into the mix, it's a whole different story. Yeah, I mean, uh, for pop culture purposes, not academic purposes, most academics are aware of the French contribution, but, but for pop culture purposes, I went and looked at like YouTube and looked in Hollywood films that maybe talk about this era and just try and figure out like who's giving any credit to the French. I think that crappy Mel Gibson movie at least shows the Marquis de Lafayette at some point, which yeah. is a wildly inaccurate movie, but whatever, at least shows him. And then I, I, I found some footage on YouTube way back in like 2014, 2015, uh, Virginia, uh, the French sailed like a symbolic ship called the Hermione, like a frigate to Virginia, like as a, like a symbolic historical act to be like, Hey, remember when we did this thing together? It was pretty cool. And like, that's it. That's like all I've been really been able to find. It's not, it's not something that's super common knowledge outside of like military historians or just regular old historians. So we kind of forget the French contribution. We don't kind of, we do. And then the last thing, how parts of the war for independence are actually setting the stage For the future ethnic cleansing campaign, no longer by the British, no longer by the French, no longer by the Spanish, but by the United States of America. So that's all I have at this point. We're setting the stage for some more future episodes. Um, So yeah, what do you got? Oh, I just want to add that it's also setting the stage for the way that blacks are treated in the country also. Not that oh, yeah, the that stage was a, wasn't yeah. set before, but it yeah. just continues this long, rich tradition, that was a obviously. Given, right? But all the other places that are like, well, not all of them, the Spanish are exempted, but all of the other entities, major entities, in this case, both the French and British, abolish slavery long before the United States does. I mean, it's, yeah, it's, we're bad, man. I mean, we have a, we have a gross history, not that people didn't know that already from the prior eight, nine, 10 episodes, whatever we're on at this point, like that's what we're doing here. So we're trying to outline these issues like again, and that's why we're kind of going in a linear form is we want you all to be able to make the connections. So anything else? No, I think that takes us home. So thanks for listening to this episode of the revolution and ideology podcast. You can get, uh, at us, find us on the web revolution and ideology.com. If you want to drop us a note on Twitter, you can do that. Uh, we're at Rev and Ideology. Uh, do do me a favor and go on to uh, your favorite podcasting app and rate us and give us a review. Um, if you have an iTunes account, you can do it on Apple Podcasts, and that will help us grow into the rank- in the rankings and uh, find some more uh, listeners. Uh, yeah, that's it. I'm Nick. I'm Jared. Till next time. <laughs>